हेलो 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 वेरी वॉर्म वेरी गुड इवनिंग माय डियर कोलीग्स रेस्पेक्टेड सीनियर्स एंड एवरीबॉडी टू दिस सीएमई वेयर द टॉपिक इज कॉमन स्किन डिसीजेस द सीएमई इज बीइंग कंडक्टेड बाय डॉक्टर पायल हु इज अ स्पेशलिस्ट इन डर्मेटोलॉजी करेंटली पोस्टेड इन द स्पेशलिस्ट विंग इन सफदरजंग हॉस्पिटल Uh, the topic for today is common skin diseases uh, as a medical officer in wellness center skin lesions are something we uh, very commonly uh, encounter they could be isolated skin lesions or uh, dermatological manifestation and presentation of certain systemic illnesses and diagnosing them at the earliest and treating them accordingly is very important also we encounter a lot of patients who have uh, take over the counter prescriptions of corticosteroid enhanced cream leading to uh, later aggravation of the skin lesion and uh, problems faced thereon so uh, we hope to discuss those topics in the cme today i request all the participants that if there are any queries regarding the topic they might please type it in the chat box and we will take them uh, in the end of the session for discussion so without further ado i hand over the session to ma'am ma'am please thank you so much dr nitya is my screen visible am i audible yes ma'am you are audible and the screen is visible dr nitya yes ma'am yes okay so good evening everybody uh, i am dr payal i am a specialist in dermatology uh, and i am working in subdivision hospital so uh, the cme today is about common skin diseases it is a very very big topic uh, so i've tried to uh, make it uh, concise and give you more pictorial uh, uh, representation of the various uh, common skin diseases that we see uh so uh, as we all know a dermatologist is a physician who can identify a rash and uh, as skin is the largest organ of the body the skin diseases can also be a mirror of the internal diseases like dr nitya mentioned uh, a lot of systemic diseases also present with uh, cutaneous manifestations and uh, easy to uh, an easy way to diagnose uh, or suspect an internal disease is when you can easily see a rash so um, that way it is uh, very important that we do know the common presentations of skin diseases identifying skin conditions need keen observation though because uh, everything looks similar when we start our residency it is uh, everything looks absolutely the same so uh, uh, my uh, seniors always use, always used to say that you have to keep reading and keep seeing more patients because uh, your eyes will see what the mind knows so uh, to differentiate uh, a very common uh, infective uh, disease from an inflammatory disease takes a lot of keen observation and uh, repeated uh, seeing of that uh, uh, dermatosis so i hope after the cme ends uh, you will be uh, much better equipped to handle the common skin conditions that we see in our general opd also uh, so like all the uh, medical conditions the common skin diseases can be classified into infective which consists of uh, bacterial fungal viral and parasitic infestations and there are inflammatory conditions which also mostly are autoimmune conditions uh, that we see in dermatology then there are conditions disorders of pigmentation both hyper and hypopigmentation and depigmentation we also see a lot of cutaneous adverse drug reactions uh which we need to know of and uh, i have tried to put the common ones and then there are there are uh, miscellaneous skin disorders that we will talk about so first coming to the bacterial infections which is also known as pyoderma uh 
mostly it is caused by two gram positive organisms one is the staphylococcus aureus and the second is the beta hemolytic uh, streptococcus pyogenes group a uh, it is uh, if we broadly classify pyoderma into two categories one is the primary and the other is secondary when we talk about secondary pyoderma it basically means that the patient already has an underlying skin disorder which is secondarily gotten infected by um, staphylococcus or streptococcus so in the primary uh, pyoderma we have follicular and non follicular pyodermas so essentially it is whether the fo hair follicle is, is being uh, colonized and infected or whether the hair follicle is not uh, infected so in the follicular variant we have folliculitis we have furuncle carbuncle and abscess and in the non follicular variant we have impetigo bullous impetigo cellulitis erysipelas paronychia and ecthyma i will just show you some pictures which will make it easier for you to now recognize these conditions this is a, these are the follicular pyodermas as you can see the first picture is of folliculitis wherein we can see discrete infective uh, redness and pus filled uh, lesions right near right around the hair follicle but they are all isolated and they don't involve the surrounding skin so much so this is a normal superficial folliculitis this picture is a that of a furuncle furuncle is when the hair follicle gets infected along with infection of the surrounding skin also so this is quite tender uh, painful and tender and uh, the patient uh, experiences a lot of discomfort Uh, coming on to carbuncle carbuncle is when multiple hair follicles uh, multiple furuncles join it becomes a carbuncle uh, most commonly seen in diabetics and other immunocompromised patients and it shows a lot of follic a uh, lot of pus filled openings and usually requires drainage and abscess as we all know is a collection of pus uh, which can also uh, happen primarily or even secondarily then the non follicular pyodermas the very superficial ones uh, are uh, basically impetigo contagiosa and bullous impetigo so this is uh, impetigo contagiosa caused mostly by streptococcus uh, 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 species and the characteristic is this honey colored crust that we see usually around the nasolabial area in bullous impetigo we see bulle which is fluid filled lesions so these are very very flaccid bulle which rupture very easily and they leave behind such superficial erosions which can then be covered by crusts both of them are uh, mild infections but bullous impetigo can also turn become so extensive that you know the patient uh, might end up uh, with dehydration and skin failure so we need to be careful when we talk about bullous uh, when we see bullous impetigo patients especially in a very young child then the other this uh, i think everybody must have seen similar patients in the um, their opd this is a acute paronychia patient which is basically the infection of a the proximal nail fold so this nail fold gets infected it gets swollen it's extremely painful and then if you see there is a pus point then uh, immediate rupture of that pus point and release of the pus leads to improvement and resolution of the paronychia ecthyma uh, is, although it is not very commonly seen but we should be uh, aware of how an ecthyma lesion looks so we have a superficial crusted uh, lesion and uh, when we remove the crust we see a deep underlying ulcer so this is how an ecthyma lesion usually looks like so it looks uh, quite superficial in the from the surface but when we remove the crust we see a deep ulcer then erysipelas and cellulitis i think we all uh, remember these from our uh, surgery rotation so erysipelas and uh, cellulitis are again non follicular pyodermas which are deeper which involve deeper till now all the lesions that i have told you are mostly superficial these are deeper in erysipelas it is uh, angry red looking and it is more uh, uh, the margins are more well uh, localized and face is a common area for erysipelas caused mainly by streptococcus cellulitis uh, again i think all of us must have seen this uh, presentation where in the uh, patient presents with a warm uh, painful tender plaque which is uh, mostly which has a tendency to uh, develop in the lower limbs now coming on to the treatment i have uh, summed up the treatment for the entire uh, bacterial infections uh, together so in cases of superficial pyodermas like folliculitis like impetigo bullous impetigo 
uh, warm soaks, uh, warm saline soaks, and condies compressors. Condies is basically potassium permanganate. So condies compressors can be given. Topical antibiotics like fusidic acid, mupirocin, betadine, fermicetin, uh, commonly known as sofromycin. And there are newer antibiotics also, which is the ozonoxazin uh, cream, which is a very, very broad spectrum, good antibiotic, especially for MRSA also. Uh, for the deep bio, uh, biodermas, we need topical antibiotics, of course, but we also need systemic antibiotics in those, uh, those uh, infections. Uh, the first line should always be a, a, a penicillin or a early generation cephalosporins. So cloxacillin works very well for all these staph infections. We can give cephalexin, we can give amoxicillin. Then cephalosporins can be used, tetracyclines, macrolides, Quinolones, clindamycin, linezolate, all of them have been used. But I would request all of you to please use antibiotics very, very judiciously, especially in cases of superficial pyodermas, because though the, these conditions are not life-threatening and there is an increased uh, antibiotic resistance that we are seeing, which is increasing every single day. So kindly use antibiotics very, very judiciously. Always start with, an, with a penicillin or a first or second generation cephalosporin. And linezolid and clindamycin should be used sparingly only in cases where uh, the other, uh, only after pus culture and only when we see that uh, the patient is not improving with our standard treatment. And surgical drainage may be required in some cases, especially in uh, the, uh, especially in uh, abscess, carbuncle and uh, paronychia. So surgical drainage may also be required in these cases. Now coming to viral infections, viral infections are chiefly, uh, I have tried to cover a few of the commonly seen viral infections, which are warts, molluscum contagiosum, herpes simplex infections, varicella zoster and herpes zoster, and hand, hand foot and mouth disease. So uh, coming on to the warts, so viral warts, which are also known as veruca, uh, are uh, caused by HPV virus, human papilloma virus, and they can have a varied presentation. So I've tried to uh, incorporate the most common presentation that we see. So these warty, warty outgrowths that we see on the fingers, these are called veruca vulgaris, the most common presentation. These are the warty outgrowths. And uh, in patients who uh, have a habit of finger chewing, nail chewing, they can also develop periungual warts. And these are very, very difficult and resistant to treatment. So if you see a wart in a child or a patient uh, on their hands or near their mouth, do recommend them not to chew their fingers. The other picture on the left is uh, of uh, these flat hyperpigmented papules, which are uh, commonly seen. And we also see that these, are, these appear in lines this is a phenomenon called as cognitive phenomenon. So wherever the patient touches uh, the uh, wards, they get auto inoculated. And uh, this is how the inoculation happens. And we see a lot of um, transmission also from uh, one person to the other and from one uh, place of the body to the other. This is a mucosal wart. This is the inside of the mouth, but uh, mucosal warts are also very significant because HPV uh, involves the genital mucosa also, and genital warts are a very common problem that we see. In fact, the most common that we see in our STD clinics. Uh, on the palms and soles, uh, the warts can assume a picture like this, wherein it uh, can be confused with a corn also. So when we pair the lesion, pairing is when we superficially slice off the dead skin uh, in a horizontal plane, we usually see these blood vessels uh, these dotted blood vessels, these are not seen in uh, corn. These are usually seen in a wart. So if we see this on our superficial pairing, then we know that this is a wart and needs to be treated because it has the potential to transmit from one place to the other and from one person to the other. The treatment options uh, in a very superficial wart, we can try uh, trichloroacetic acid, TCA, like we say, and uh, electrocautery or CO2 laser or radio frequency ablation. All of these are basically methods to ablate the uh, lesions. Salicylic acid and salicylic acid and lactic acid combination is usually reserved for places which have thick skin like palms and sores. Cryotherapy, which is using liquid nitrogen to freeze the viral wart and destroy it, is also used. Then uh, for the viral wart, again, all of these can be used. Uh, specifically for uh, viral warts, we also use podophyllin and imicromode. 
Uh, newer modalities have also uh, are also being developed now for the treatment of recalcitrant and extensive warts, which include injection bleomycin, which works very well if we, when we give it intralesional for a periangual wart, and also MMR vaccine, which is given subcutaneous as well as on the intralesional lesion in an extensive wart patient. Bulascum contagiosum is a very, very common childhood uh, lesion, uh, skin lesion that you will see caused by the pox virus. We see asymptomatic. Uh, the child is not bothered by them. It's only because they are visible that the parents get bothered. And they are asymptomatic and dome-shaped umbilicated papules. We always see a small umbilication on the top of it. Uh, like I said, common in children. And uh, although Bulascum contagiosum uh, is a very, very uh, common and uh, harmless as to say a condition, but it might also be a sign of uh, underlying immunocompromised uh, mild state, especially HIV, where we see hundreds and thousands of molluscum, especially on the face and upper body. It is actually a sign that the child, the patient might need serological testing for HIV. Uh, it's usually self-resolving and resolves in eight to nine months to a year. But if we want uh, uh, treatment, then uh, treatment modalities include removal, extirpation of the molluscum body by needle. And we can also do TCA application and KOH, potassium hydroxide can also be applied. That's a self-application also. All of these uh, modalities commonly will get rid of the molluscum. Now, coming on to the herpes simplex infection, it is caused by herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, which is part of the human herpes uh, virus group. Uh, Various areas can be involved like herpes labialis, herpetic gingivostomatitis, herpetic keratitis, herpetic whitlow, and herpetic herpes genitalis. So now here I have uh, taken a picture from a patient who had the first episode of herpes simplex. And as you see, there are multiple uh, cycles which are seen. And these cycles then rupture and form uh, a small superficial erosion with serpiginous border. And uh, the first episode, usually herpes labialis, uh, is caused by the HSV-1 variant and HSV-2 virus usually causes the genital herpes. Uh, this is a photograph of herpetic Whitlow. Uh, Whitlow is when the finger spaces are involved. Keratitis and gingivostomatitis in, uh, keratitis will involve the eye and gingivostomatitis will involve the lips and the gingiva and it is extremely painful uh, along with uh, uh, there is submandibular lymphadenopathy also. The first episode of herpes simplex is usually uh, symptomatic. The patient can have fever, melee, and uh, extreme pain. Uh, recurrent recurrence is a uh, almost hundred percent in all patients. So recurrence is the recurrent. Uh, the subsequent episodes are usually not so symptomatic. Treatment is again by acyclovir and valacyclovir, and femcivir can also be used. The varicella zoster virus uh, can kind of can present in two ways. One is the varicella zoster, commonly known as chicken pox, wherein uh, very classically you can see uh, there's a dew on a petal appearance. So there's mild erythema, and then there is a small vesicle which is seen on this. All the body sites can be involved, and uh, we should advise the patient not to pick these lesions because it can lead to scars, uh, which are very difficult to go. Uh, and in the older age group, as our immunity goes down, we see we are seeing herpes zoster in children also, but usually it is uh, considered to be uh, more prevalent in old age and in patients who have an uh, uh, immunocompromised state. And uh, in that extremely painful uh, dermatomal vesicles uh, and erythema is seen, uh, the patient is in a lot of pain, uh, so uh, we need to take care of that and we again need to tell the patient that uh, uh, not to pick these lesions and not to uh, cause scarring. Treatment again for varicella and herpes zoster is the same. We usually use acyclovir in the doses of 800 mg five times a day for seven days or uh, varicella, uh, valacyclovir can be used in the doses of one gram TDS for seven days. Varicella zoster in children needs does not need the uh, acyclovir. Uh, it just needs symptomatic management. But after teenage, uh, uh, you may consider giving acyclovir to the patient. Um, 
uh, I'm sorry, the image for this uh, was, there was some technical issue and I could not uh, show this, but hand foot mouth disease, uh, there was a recent outbreak in the months of October, November, December, and we saw a lot of children with hand foot and mouth disease. So I thought, although it is, uh, it was not a very common disease earlier on, but in, since the last few years we are seeing, so I thought I will uh, discuss this too. So again, it's a disease of childhood. Uh, and as the name suggests, hand, foot, and mouth disease. So we see uh, uh, asymptomatic to mildly painful or itchy uh, uh, the cycles, which are grayish colored on a rhythmic background in uh, on the palms, soles, and we also see oral ulceration, which can restrict the patient's oral intake a bit. So we need to be careful. We need to start the patient on symptomatic treatment. And uh, it might also be extensive uh, involving not just the hand, foot and mouth, but involving all the flexures, the genitalia. And uh, younger children can be in a lot of pain. Dysuria can also occur if there are a lot of lesions on the external genitalia. Although uh, it is uh, symptomatic, but it is mostly self-limiting and not a very serious uh, disorder. And only symptomatic treatment is usually required. The role of acyclovir or any other antiviral is not well established. Uh, now, coming on to the fungal infections, the most common ones that we see are pityriasis versicolor, which I think almost every one of us has seen, dermatophytosis, uh, which is commonly called as tenia or ringworm, and candidiasis. Candidiasis is not very common, but I'll just show you a few pictures wherein that will help you to diagnose it when you see the patient. So this is a common presentation of pityriasis versicolor, where we see mild scaling and uh, very, very flat, superficial uh, skin color to uh, hyperpigmented or hyperpigmented. That is why it is called versicolor, because you can have any uh, color or any uh, uh, color of the involved skin. So this is how it presents and then these small small lesions they become confluent to, be, uh, to form a larger patch so it's a very superficial fungal infection and non-contagious uh, caused by the malassezia furfur yeast which is uh, a, res a normal resident of our skin on our scalp and on our uh, upper body the seboric areas uh, it is a self-limiting again it is a self-limiting uh, very very mild disease so we need not bother but the this pigmentation is the problem so we need to treat when we need to treat you need to give a ketoconazole or selenium sulfide uh, uh, lotion or shampoo to be applied and then washed off cyclopyroxamine can also be used and fluconazole if you see, feel that it is an extensive disease then fluconazole oral single dose 400 mg can be given and if you still feel that it is quite recurrent and repeatedly uh, happening then you can repeat the dose after 15 days or even itroconazole can be Use, but usually it doesn't read. We just need to counsel the patient that the pigmentation will go, will take around two to three months to go. Candidiasis. Now, the commonest presentation is, uh, of course, the oral candidiasis, which is also known as oral thrush and is common in younger children and immunocompromised patients. We can also see this similar picture can also be seen in the genital area where the patient can have uh, vulvovaginal candidiasis. Uh, intertrigo. Interdigital intertrigo is uh, again a very common uh, skin condition, which is usually seen in, uh, in immunocompromised patients and also in patients whose uh, uh, occupation is such that they have to immerse their hands in water for a long time. So that humidity and moisture leads to uh, overgrowth of candida and su hence such a picture where we see whitish deposition and fissuring between the uh, interweb fingers. Uh, this is uh, in candidiasis involving the uh, groin area. Flexures are more uh, uh, involved in case of candidiasis. That is another feature that we can remember. And then this is a patient of chronic paranoia. If you see the cuticle is lost here, there is nail changes. And uh, although acute paranoia, we saw an increased redness, swelling and pus point. Here we don't see all of that. Just the skin becomes uh, rhizomatous, itchy and uh, with repeated uh, uh, exposure to uh, water and uh, uh, detergents, this keeps on worsening and the nail also starts worsening. Candida is a uh, common pathogen which is involved, although chronic paranoia is a uh, multifactorial disease. So uh, it is, like I said, more in immunocompromised and diabetes, diabetic patients. And topical azoles like uh, clotrimazole, myconazole, uh, laliconazole, these are the, usually the first line 
and in for mouth we you uh, we do have uh, uh, clotrimazole mouth paints which can be used and they are safer in cases of extensive disease we use oral fluconazole and itraconazole and that leads to an improve, improvement and we also need to tell the patient to restrict their uh, water based activities now dermatophytosis uh, for the last 5 to 6 years uh, it has been uh, a dermatologist nemesis because uh, the, we are seeing uh, such varied cases of dermatophytosis and it is just not working. Uh, the treatment is just not working. The patient is extremely dissatisfied because there is so much resistance to the uh, medicines that we have available and also such indiscriminate use of topical corticosteroid along with very, very high potency steroid creams like uh, a combination of clobetasol cream, which is a very potent steroid we see so many companies uh, producing them and that has led to a very, very, very big problem of uh, antifungal resistance in such cases. So uh, dermatophytosis is basically, uh, in common terms, we call it tinea or ringworm. And according to the area uh, of the body, which involves right into tinea corporis, cruris, which means the flexure, uh, which means the groin and the flexures, capitis is the head, pedis is the Foot and manam is the hand and anguam is the nails. So all of them can be involved by the dermatophytes. This is a lesion. You can see this is a tinea corporis where we see uh, this ring-like border. So we have an annular lesion and uh, it starts clearing from the center and then it keeps spreading from the on the periphery. So this is a hallmark of a tinea lesion. And uh, this is the tinea cruris patient. And if I don't know if you can appreciate, but there is a lot of thinning of the skin, whitening of the skin, and there are stry marks, stretch marks also. This is because of the abuse of uh, topical steroid plus antifungal uh, cream use. And this is how then the patient comes to us. And uh, there are huge stry and uh, atrophy of the skin. And uh, you know the patient is in a lot of pain and trouble. Uh, and it takes a lot longer for patients who have been treated with uh, steroid creams to improve. So uh, I wanted to send this message uh, across. Kindly do not prescribe uh, the steroid uh, for a, for any tinea patient, even if you are not sure that it is a fungal infection, if you are uh, confused between whether it is an eczema or an infection, always go for treating the infection first. Just give the patient a plain antifungal, plain azole cream, and uh, if the patient doesn't improve, please refer them to us. We we'll, uh, see what to do. But uh, we should not prescribe uh, the combination creams to uh, any patient who you even suspect uh, remotely that he might have tinea, because it will do a lot of harm to the patient if we give the combination creams. Now, tinea capitis, uh, this is a, uh, usually happens in ch uh, children, not usually seen in adults. And, uh, there is a patch of hair loss with gray or black appearance. And this is called a kirion. It is a very, very advanced neglected stage wherein there is inflammation. Uh, the species which causes it uh, is the inflammatory zoophilic species of uh, dermatophytes. And uh, it causes a lot of uh, uh, pain. And there is an abscess with studded pustules, you can see. And there is a huge amount of hair loss. And if not treated early, this leads to a irreversible loss of uh, scalp uh, hair or patch of alopecia. So it needs to be identified quickly and treated with oral antifungus. Tinea pedis, like I said, uh, is the involvement of the foot. And as we can again clearly see, there is a very good clear margin. So wherever you see a margin like this and the patient presents with a unilateral appearance, unilateral uh, uh, lesion like this with also involvement of the nail folds uh, and nails and the webs do suspect tinea and just give a plain antifungal and ask them to refer to to uh, see a dermatologist uh, tinea manum again like i said uh, is the involvement of hand i have picked this picture specifically to tell you that even though this looks a lot like hand eczema that we see but if it is usually uh, asymptomatic and it is usually unilateral then it is more likely to be tinea than uh, eczema and even if you suspect it is eczema but you have a doubt it has scaling or it is unilateral uh, just give the patient plain antifungal or a plain emollient like uh, whites of paraffin or salicylic acid and uh, refer the patient to us so the treatment for all the uh, uh, 
superficial or uh, fungal infections is again topical uh, treatment involves azoles which uh, can be by clotrimazole cream, meconazole, sertaconazole, ladiconazole, etc. Tabinafine can also be used as a topical agent and uh, endolfin and cycloperoxamine are also now being used because of uh, a lot of resistance to the topical azoles. Avoid combination of antifungals with steroid cream. I think this, uh, even if this one uh, take home message uh, is, uh, you know, uh, if you can go away with this uh, take home message, uh, it will do a great lot of good to all the patients who come with, uh, uh, you know, steroid abuse and side effects of the steroid creams. Uh, systemic agents, as again, are azoles. We can use hydroconazole, weekly fluconazole, although that is very, uh, not very. Uh, highly effective. Tabinafine oral can be given and nowadays we have to give uh, uh, against the recommended four to six weeks we are uh, sometimes uh, even have to give the treatment for eight to twelve weeks which I uh, which takes a toll on the patient's liver and uh, kidneys also. So um, humble request to not uh, combine the antifungals with steroid. For uh, tinea capitis the gold standard uh, oral treatment is griseofulvin. And uh, also, the patient should be advised general uh, measures like uh, uh, general hygiene, having a bath every day, keeping the flexures uh, uh, dry with a, with nicely pad drying the skin, and not sharing their uh, towels or uh, clothes with somebody else because it might transfer. And therapy is usually for uh, two to three months for nails and uh, topical therapy might continue for even up to six to nine months. Now coming on to the parasitic infection, I think this is probably the most uh, uh, common uh, skin disease that you must have seen in the last four or five months in winters. So it is it's called scabies, which is a mite infection caused by Sarcoptus scabii. Extremely itchy papules. There is nocturnal exacerbation. Usually a family history is present and it is very, very contagious. So we need to identify and we treat, need to treat the patient as well as their family members in the same time. Uh, treatment again is just by 5% permethrin cream. Uh, in a small child less than 12 years, you can use half a 30 gram tube. And in an adult, an entire 30 gram tube has to be used at one time. Ivermectin, oral as well as ivermectin cream are now also available, which can also be used to use uh, to uh, treat scabies. Topical ivermectin, uh, oral ivermectin is given in the dose of 200 micrograms per kg. Usually uh, adults uh, less than six years we don't give and more than six years you can give. And 12, uh, it is available in a dose of six milligram and eight mi uh, 12 milligram tablets. And treatment of the entire family along with treatment of the linen and the beds is also recommended. The classical uh, uh, lesion which can place the diagnosis are these interweb burrows uh, which are very very classical and typical for humans. The other is pediculosis capitis. I think all of my, you must have seen or uh, even had pediculosis capitis as a child. So it's the head lice caused by the pediculus humanus capitis uh, louse. It is very common in children especially in uh, orphanages, homes and school going children. Very contagious, again, with close contact. And treatment is by permethrin 1% rinse and ivermectin 0.5% shampoo, which can be repeated after a week. And even oral ivermectin can be given if there is a severe infestation with secondary infection. Now, come on, coming on to mycobacterial infections, although they are, uh, I can't uh, really call them common skin infections, but leprosy forms uh, an important part of skin infections, and we are still seeing a lot of leprosy patients. So I thought I will include a few slides about leprosy and cutaneous tuberculosis. So leprosy, it is still a public health problem, and there is a spectrum of disease manifestation. It is a great mimicker like syphilis. Uh, the Spectrum ranges from tuberculoid uh, leprosy to lepromatous leprosy. Tuberculoid is a fossi bacillary form. Lepromatous leprosy is extremely uh, high load multi bacillary form. So the lesions can uh, range from a hypoesthetic, which means uh, where there is less sensation, hypopigmented lesion, well demarcated patches, to a diffuse infiltration of the skin by the mycobacterium leprae bacilli. There is peripheral nerve enlargement, which is an uh, which can be a good indicator or a sign. Cranial nerve involvement can also be seen where the patient can directly present to you with maybe facial palsy or uh, ptosis and uh, that can be a indication that the child patient has uh, leprosy. 
deformities and nerve palsies like facial palsy foot drop claw hand are uh, quite uh, commonly seen in uh, leprosy and they pose, pose a significant challenge uh, for recovery and uh, future rehabilitation of the patient so earlier we diagnose and earlier we identify uh, the better the treatment result for the patient the management usually is by uh, it is usually uh, diagnosed clinically but to start uh, the treatment we might need a stitch and smear that we make from the skin lesions and also from the normal skin and a skin biopsy can also be done wherein we see a granulomatous uh, chronic inflammation and uh, uh, AFB can also be seen so uh, once we have the stitch and smear or the biopsy uh, findings we can start the treatment. The treatment is by multi-drug therapy which is also known as MDT and uh, in cases where uh, the patient develops ulcers or claw hand or foot drop where, or contractures, reconstructive surgery may be needed. This is a photograph showing various lesions that we can see in leprosy. Like this is a well-defined erythematous uh, to hypopigmented plaque, which is seen in the early tuberculoid spectrum. And uh, this is a localized possibacillary disease. These are nodular lesions that we usually see later on. This is what I was talking about. This is called infiltration. So the earlobes and the eyelids usually become infiltrated. Uh, and sometimes it become it can become so infiltrated that it leads to the leonine facies, the lion-like facies, which has, uh, like this patient has. Uh, these lesions are uh, the lesions of uh, borderline lepromatous leprosy, where you see confluent lesions and a uh, few of the uh, sparing uh, normal skin also. And uh, here again, you see there is a lot of infiltration. This is a borderline tuberculo tuberculoid or borderline lepromatous leprosy. And this lesion, uh, these type of lesions are also seen, nodular lesions are also seen in histoid Hansen, which is a type of multivacillary disease. The sequelae, like I said, can be non-healing ulcers and the uh, palsies. The treatment is by multidrug therapy, uh, WHO MDT regimen, wherein they give uh, three medicines, uh, which is rifampicin, uh, dapsone, and clofazamine for the patient. And it is given for 12 months uh, in case of MDMDT. PBMDT is also uh, given to uh, patients with possibacillary lesions with a stitch and smear, which is negative for AFT. And in that, we omit the clofazamine. Clofazamine leads to skin pigmentation. So that is a common side effect that we need to tell the patient. Rifampicin, uh, rifampicin dose is uh, not daily in a patient of uh, leprosy, it is monthly. Dapsone and clofazamine are given daily. Cutaneous tuberculosis, uh, not very common, again, I will say, but we do see patients of cutaneous tuberculosis in our, and it would be uh, a good idea to sensitize you all to uh, the various common presentations. So we have the common presentations are lupus vulgaris, prophyloderma, TBVC, and tuberculosis. Uh, this is a patient of uh, lupus. Lupus vulgaris, where we see a plaque with atrophy and advancing edge, and sometimes we see an atrophic uh, uh, edge here. Scrofuloderma is when we see a plaque or an ulcer overlying a lymph node or an underlying bone. This is a TBVC plaque, tuberculosis, varicosa cutis, and these are called tuberculids. So these are basically hypersensitivity reaction, wherein we don't find AFD in these uh, lesions if we biopsy them. So what we need to do for cutaneous tuberculosis is that we need to screen for underlying or internal organ tuberculosis. Montu has to be done. Chest X-ray has to be done. Arcasan abdomen to find out whether there is an underlying uh, oh, underlying focus. Skin biopsy needs to be done. And culture for AFB, of course, is the gold standard for diagnosis. Treatment is by category 1, ATT, the extra pulmonary. So HRZE plus HRE for four. Now, coming on to the inflammatory diseases, the first is eczema. It's basically a dermatitis which is characterized by erythema, edema, oozing in the acute stage, crusting and scaling in the subacute stage, and lichenification. Lichenification uh, is seen in the chronic stages. What is lichenification? It is basically increased in the skin markings, increased uh, hyperpigmentation of the lesion, and thickening. So these three findings together make lichenification. It can be exogenous or endogenous. Exogenous is basically contact dermatitis, which is from an exter external source. It can be allergic or irritant. Endogenous, then we have all the endogenous eczemas like atopic dermatitis, discoid eczema, seboric dermatitis, pitreasis alba, asteatotic eczema, stasis dermatitis, and neurodermatitis like lichen cyclix chronicus and chorigo. Exogenous eczema, uh, this is, I tried to uh, 
incorporate uh, multiple exogenous uh, dermatitis that we see. This is an uh, ACD allergic contact dermatitis to nickel, which the patient had because of his uh, watch strap. This is because of Sindhur or Bindi. Dermatitis are very, very common presentation. This presentation is common uh, if we can appreciate this oozing and crusting here and there is so much facial edema. This is a very common presentation nowadays, air, uh, allergic contact dermatitis to hair dye application. <laughs> you can see the jet black hair here. And uh, this is uh, a patient who had uh, ACD allergic contact dermatitis to the detergent presenting as eczematous patches on the hand. And this is a patient who applied garlic on his face for uh, some skin disorder and led to this burn and irritant contact dermatitis. So irritant contact dermatitis usually is more acute, is more symptomatic and uh, more than itching, it has burning and then the skin starts to peel off. The endogenous eczemas, the most common and the most important is atopic dermatitis, uh, not the most common, but uh, very important to diagnose is atopic dermatitis, wherein uh, in childhood, infantile uh, age group, the child usually has lesions on the face and the uh, extensor aspects of the body. And as the child grows up, uh, the lesion then localized to lichenified plaques in the pectoral area. So it goes from a extend uh, from an extensor uh, predominant uh, disease to a flexor predominant uh, disease. And uh, then rather than involving the entire body, then it usually starts involving few focal areas. So this is how commonly atopic dermatitis will present. Boric dermatitis, uh, this is the common presentation where we have uh, what we commonly call as dandruff in our uh, uh, normal language, layman terms. So the patient also has erythema and scaling, which involves all the hair bearing areas of the body, like scalp, uh, eyebrows, uh, eyelids can also be seborrheic blepharitis is also a common presentation. Then the nasolabial folds are very commonly involved, the beard, the moustache, the chest, axilla uh, behind the ear, all of these lesions can. This is how it looks with the uh, yellowish scales. Aceototic dermatitis, we see a lot of aceototic dermatitis because of our uh, pensioners that we see in our CGS wellness clinic. And the patients usually present in winters with dry, scaly skin, and it is extremely itchy. So you need to tell the patient that it is a, a normal age-related change, and we need to tell the management, which I will cover later. Stasis dermatitis or venous eczema, usually we see in patients with varicose veins or uh, any other venous insufficiency. And uh, this is how it looks like, uh, usually involves the lower third of the leg and foot. And uh, in chronic cases, it can also become lichenified and uh, ulceration can happen. And a lot of uh, itching and uh, secondary infection can also happen. Neurodermatitis, uh, the patient presents it with two of these, these are, uh, two of these classical uh, features. One is this is lichen simplex chronicus, where there is a circumscribed patch with lichenification. So this is lichenification. There are increased skin markings, if you can appreciate, hyperpigmentation, and there is thickening also. And for nodularis, we have nodules and papules, which are ulcerated and hyperpigmented and extremely, extremely itchy. And the patient does, can just not stop scratching, wherein... Uh, uh, it's very, it's a difficult disease to control. Treatment for all the eczemas, whether endogenous or exogenous, the general measures remain the same. For a, the exogenous, we have to avoid the allergens or the uh, irritants. That is the most important. Gentle cleansing, we should use soap-free cleansers and uh, we should really tell our patients not to use the medicated soaps. They're very fond of using uh, Dettol soaps and... Uh, uh, Savlon soap, neem soap. So we should tell them not to do that and use a very, very mild cleanser or it is not important to use a soap, in, especially in cases where the patient has a lot of dermatitis. Emollients. Emollients are basically moisturizers. They should be bland, hypoallergenic, like bites of paraffin, coconut oil. These are very good uh, emollients. Emollients have to be prescribed in all cases of eczema, except when the patient has active secondary infection. At that point of time, we should first wait for the patient to uh, treat. We should first treat the secondary infection, and then we need to start emollients. Topical corticosteroids are the mainstay of treatment, but there are plenty of side effects to corticosteroids, like I mentioned during my uh, senior slides. So uh, counsel the patient about uh, not keeping to uh, apply the treatment when the lesions have resolved. He should use the treatment only SOS basis whenever the patient has uh, eczema he will use and when it resolves he should stop using the steroids. 
Topical calcineurin inhibitors like tetrolimus and pimetrolimus are also very useful and they can be used for maintenance. Uh, in very severe cases, we need to give oral steroids. Again, the same, uh, the same rule applies here also. We need to limit the amount and we'll need to limit the duration for which we give the oral steroids. Immunosuppressants are also uh, required in some very severe cases uh, where we don't want to give oral steroids like cyclosporin, acetylopin, etc. in severe and recalcitrant uh, cases. Uh, biologicals have now come up for atopic dermatitis, although dupilumab is not presently available in India, but it has shown very promising results in atopic dermatitis in the Western world. Psoriasis, it is a chronic relapsing inflammatory skin condition. Nails and joints are also affected. Scalp is also infected. There are many, many morphological variants. The common ones are psoriasis vulgaris. The common is guttate psoriasis, palmo plantar psoriasis, where only the palms and soles are involved, and scalp psoriasis. Isolated scalp psoriasis is also seen. And also psoriatic arthritis, where we might or may or may not have the skin lesion. So this is how a psoriasis lesion, typical psoriasis lesion looks like. It's a well demarcated salmon colored to pink rhizomatous scaly plaque and the scale, the scale is micaceous or whitish silvery scale. Uh, nail psoriasis, this is how it looks. So you have thickening of the nail, you have distal onycholysis leading to this yellowish discoloration and pitting. If you can see these small dots, these are basically depressions which are called pits. So we have a lot of pits. And this is again the typical, the classical lesion that we saw in psoriasis vulgaris on the body can also affect the scalp, isolated also. Treatment, again, topical agents are corticosteroids, vitamin D analogs like calcitriol and calcitriol, salicylic acid to reduce the scaling, coal tar and emollients, all of them can be used. Sun, uh, the patient should be advised to go out in sun. Sunlight helps uh, psoriasis in most cases. Uh, then systemic agents, uh, so, if the patient has mild psoriasis not involving more than say 10% of the body surface area and not involving any joint, we usually stick with the topical agents. We don't need to give the systemic agents. But in severe cases and in psoriatic arthritis, we have to give the patient systemic agents. So we can give weekly methotrexate, uh, cyclosporin. Cyclosporin is uh, uh, used mainly for a, as a rescue agent when the psoriasis is very, very severe and life threatening. Retinoids, acetretin, et cetera, can be used. Phototherapy is again a very commonly uh, used modality for psoriasis. And biologicals, uh, the most commonly used nowadays is secuquinema. It has to be used in patients who are recalcitrant to the standard therapy. Lichen planus. Uh, so lichen planus, I still remember the way we remembered it. So we have flat polygonal uh, purple papules, which are flat top. This is how it presents, extremely itchy. Usually involves the extensors, uh, usually involves the flexures aspect. This is a patient who also had it on the hand. And uh, there is another variant wherein we can only have the pigmentation. There is usually no itching or very mild itching. This is called lichen planus pigmentosis. Again, an uh, inflammatory condition. Uh, nail, so, uh, nail lichen planus can also present like these. These are called, this is a pup tent sign and uh, it leads to uh, gross disfiguring and uh, even breakage of nail plates. So uh, recognition of this earlier on is important so that we can treat. Oral lichen planus will present like a uh, lacy pattern, especially on the insides of the cheek. And uh, mercury fillings earlier on were a common predisposing factor for this. Treatment, again, is by corticosteroids and calcineurin inhibitors. And systemic for systemic treatment, we can use Dapson, short course of steroids, cyclosporin, and retinoids. Uh, now coming on to the drug reactions, urticaria, this must, this is the most common presentation that we have in our emergency departments uh, of a skin condition. It is also known as hives or bees. In, in adults, the most common cause is uh, drugs and in children, infection, underlying infection is the most common cause. So it can present just with isolated, raised, reddish, itchy lesions on the body where it is called acute urticaria. And it can also involve the soft tissue, uh, the softer skin around the eyelids, oral um, lips and the genitalia and then this is called injury so um, treatment is by antihistamines we should avoid giving steroids in every possible uh, in any mild case of urticaria however if the patient has uh, angioedema or the patient has severe uh, extensive involvement or the patient uh, complaints of hypotension or hoarseness of voice or uh, feeling dizzy or tightness of chest. And these are danger signs that the vocal cords may also be involved. And uh, then they may require 
steroids in such cases. Now coming on to acne vulgaris. Acne vulgaris is a chronic uh, inflammatory disease of the pilosebaceous glands and a very, 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 very common condition. Uh, mostly starts at puberty. Nowadays, we are seeing uh, uh, children as young as 9 to 10 years presenting with acne-like lesions. And there are a pleo it is a pleomorphic lesions. We have multiple number of lesions like comedons, papules, pustules, nodules, and cysts we can be seen. Uh, the most uh, problematic sequelae is the acne scars, which uh, not just physical, but it leads to a lot of psychological stigma to the patient. So it needs to be treated early. So these are uh, the closed common. The comedons can be of two types, which is the primary lesion. The closed comedons, where which is mostly, but which we normally call as whiteheads because they are covered and uh, they look white. And the open comedons, these are again plugs but they get uh, keratinized, uh, oxidized, so it becomes blackish. So this is the open comedons. This is the closed comedons. These are the papules and pustules that we see. And this is a severe case where we have nodulocystic acne, wherein we have uh, draining sinuses also and multiple lesions joined together to form such cystic lesion. Extremely painful also. And if not treated timely, they lead to disfiguring scars. Treatment, the topical agents again. Uh, first, we need to tell the patient to uh, cleanse the skin properly, not apply a lot of oil or occlusive agents. Uh, hair oil should be uh, avoided in all patients of acne vulgaris. Topical agents that we use are benzoyl peroxide in 2.5 and 5% 5 concentration. Retinoids are the mainstay for every patient of uh, uh, acne. Retinoin and adapalene are the most commonly used uh, compounds. Antibiotics can also be used like clindamycin and nadifoxacin. These are, uh, even Dapsone now is available in a gel form, which can be used for severe acne. Oral agents, again, antibiotics like azithromycin, doxycycline, minocycline, limecycline, even Dapsone has been tried uh, for uh, the acne. And uh, in severe nodulocystic acne, isotretinoin, oral isotretinoin is the uh, gold standard of treatment. But uh, since it is teratogenic, so it's uh, used in, uh, in women of reproductive age group should be uh, guided and the patient should be told about proper contraception. And kindly do not, uh, uh, kindly tell the patient not to uh, buy any OTC steroid cream and use for the acne. They are very fond of using Betnoid and Omate cream to apply on the face, which leads to a lot of flare up of acne. Uh, now, another uh, disease that is very, very commonly seen and uh, reason for a great amount of social stigma is vitiligo. The patient, uh, the disease itself does not cause any particular uh, uh, problem systemically, but it is so, uh, it is perceived so badly in our society that the patient uh, leads to, it leads to a lot of psychological trauma to the patient. So uh, this is a patient with segmental vitiligo, wherein the patient only has uh, vitiligo on one particular area of the body and usually doesn't spread to the other parts, but it is slightly resistant to treatment. Acrofacial is another variant wherein the patient only has involvement of the hands, feet, genital mucosa, oral mucosa, and uh, chest, the nipple area can also be involved. And then this is a patient who has an extensive involvement of all body parts. So this is called as vitiligo vulgaris. Treatment again is by topical steroids, calcineurin inhibitors like tetrolimus, sorolens can be used, and decapeptides, especially for uh, areas where we don't want to give steroids and calcineurin inhibitors like uh, oral mucosa uh, lesions. Systemic agents again, oral corticosteroid, again, the same uh, principle applies here also. We do not want to give it for a long time, we want to give it for a shorter, as short as possible just to stop the disease activity in a rapidly progressive uh, condition, not to be given in every possible uh, patient. Levamisol uh, used to be uh, quite extensively used earlier on, but now it is not used, uh, being used so much. Phototherapy, again, is a very good option uh, for patients who can't be given corticosteroids and who can come to the hospital twice or twice. And the most important with uh, all the, as with all the patients of skin diseases, especially with vitiligo, counseling and a lot of hand holding is to be done for the patient because the patient, uh, it leads to a lot of obstacles in the patient's life uh, and uh, they feel uh, discriminated against. So a lot of counseling needs to be done for these patients. Alopecia areata. This is again a very common hair disorder that we see. Uh, I'm sure all of you must 
have definitely seen one of these cases where the patient presents with sudden circumcised, circumscribed loss of uh, uh, hair or beard or moustache area and the patient is traumatized. He's very upset that I don't know what has happened. Some fungus or some fungus has, you know, uh, uh, taken away all my hair. So you can counsel the patient that it is not any, it is not an infective condition. It's a common condition and uh, it uh, usually is a uh, condition which resolves with treatment and it is uh, a good response to treatment in fact is shown. Only the uh, conditions where we have the severe extensive types like to alopecia totalis wherein the entire scalp hair is lost or universalis where the entire body hair gets lost are uh, the ones which are uh, you know uh, resistant to treatment and even then even in those uh, now newer modalities are showing promise. It is self-limiting and uh, according to a study initially uh, done uh, almost 80 percent patients uh, have some amount of hair regrowth even if not treated in a uh, mild uh, few lesions of alopecia areata. treatment is uh, the gold standard is intralesional triamcinolone injection which are depot injections which we give uh, at the uh, site of the injection not to be given intramuscular and in patients where we can't give intralesional injections like young children or others we can either wait or we can give topical steroids or topical calcineurin inhibitors and bimatoprost can be used for eyelids and the eyebrow areas. Uh, now coming on to the pigmentary uh, disorder, we have covered vitiligo. Now the hyperpigmentary disorder, again, this is a very, very common presentation. A lot of females, uh, you must have seen, uh, if, all of you must have seen melasma patients because they are quite common. The common non-inflammatory pigmentary disorder, the patient is not uh, does not have any symptoms just that it is disfiguring to have so many so much of pigmentation on the face so we see brown to brown gray pigmentation usually on the centrofacial area but upper neck uh, and upper chest and arms can also be involved in extensive it is more uh, more common in females as compared to males and mostly seen during or after pregnancy uh, it's a difficult disease to control. So again, a lot of counseling and a lot of hand holding to the patient and uh, telling them what not to do will help them a lot. So uh, the first is use of OTC creams, which contain a lot of steroid and uh, higher percentage of hydroquinone should be avoided at any cost. So you need to tell the patient right at the beginning that uh, this is a difficult condition to treat, but taking such medications will just in worsen their condition. Uh, the most important factor that we can control is sun protection. So the patient should be uh, advised against, uh, advised for uh, sun protection, physical as well as by the use of sunscreen lotions that we prescribe. Uh, any SPF about 26, 26 to 30 is okay for our skin type. So we don't need to go for a very, very high SPF unless and until the patient is very, very uh, light colored. Okay. Uh, the main... Uh, Treatment is by the depigmenting agents like uh, hydroquinone 2%, kojic acid, uh, uh, arbutin, glutathione, all that can be used. Chemical peeling can be done by glycolic acid and uh, salicylic mandelic acid peel. And uh, a newer modality is tranexamic acid, both topical as well as oral, which has shown uh, significant uh, results in a lot of patients. So that can be done uh, in patients who don't have any uh, thrombotic or uh, any coagulatory problem. Uh, lasers have also been tried, NDI lasers have been tried for uh, melasma with mixed results in our skin. Again, like I mentioned, avoid steroid creams, tell them not to buy triple combination creams from OTC and hydroquinone creams should not be used. Uh, higher concentration like 4%, 5% cream should not be used because it can lead to uchronosis uh, uh, in the lo long term and that is extremely, extremely difficult to treat. Uh, then another condition which we see is xanthalasma, which is very commonly seen. I think, again, all of you must have seen. Uh, so uh, the patient presents with yellowish deposits over the eyelids, upper and the lower eyelid, both can be involved. And in such patients, usually 10 to 15% 10 to patients can also have uh, dyslipidemia. So uh, it is important to screen the patient for uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, diabetes and uh, uh, sugar, uh, diabetes and thyroid, and also lipid profile can be done. Now, treatment for this condition is uh, not very complicated. We usually apply TCA for uh, destruction of the upper skin, and usually the fat, the deposit just comes out and uh, it gives good cosmetic results. It's a cosmetic problem. And uh, carbon dioxide laser ablation is also can also be done to physically destroy the 
steroid, uh, the fat deposits. Uh, lastly, this also again, you must have seen it in a lot of patients where the patient comes with corns and callosities. Uh, our pensioners mostly come uh, with a lot of uh, painful callosities and they are worried that they cannot step. So corns and callosities is mostly pressure induced. Uh, so that when the child, the patient is walking, the pressure is not equally distributed and the uh, area which is bearing the most of the weight leads to uh, there is thickening and there is uh, pain while walking and these sort of corn and calluses form. Uh, we need differentiating from plantar wart, which I told you initially. Uh, another point is that in a callosity or corn, the upper skin lines always are usually preserved, which is not the case with a wart. So that is also another differentiating point. Apart from when we pair, we see blood vessels in the wart lesion, not in the uh, corn. Treatment is by salicylic acid or salicylic acid lactic acid combination which the patient can self-apply. We can pair it by a surgical blade and also surgical removal can be done deeper if the patient is in a lot of pain and uh, in cryotherapy electrocautery can be done but I, it is usually not needed because uh, the patient usually gets relieved by pairing and applying the uh, softening. And also footwear change has to be told to the patient and uh, the cause has to be explained that it is because of the uh, uh, pressure being uh, you know shifted to just one area of the foot. Uh, thank you. I uh, thank you for a very patient listening. I hope uh, this CME would help you to uh, you know manage and identify the skin lesions. Uh, if there are any questions. Uh, you're thank today. you, uh, Dr. Payal, ma'am. It was a comprehensive yet concise uh, presentation covering almost most of the common uh, dermatological uh, symptoms or manifestations that we see in our routine practice. Uh, there are a few queries in the chat box, uh, so if we can take them up. Uh, a doctor has asked, uh, what is the dose and duration for tranexamic acid that we use for uh, melasma treatment? Yeah, so melasma treatment, we can use uh, the doses uh, range from 250 BD or 500 mg OD. Uh, for three to six months, studies have shown that you can use it for three to six months safely. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you, ma'am. Uh, we had also uh, discussed about the uh, uh, antifungal, topical antifungals, which can be used when uh, treating nail infections. So yes. they generally come in a lacquer form. Is there yes. any duration uh, or the frequency that it has to be applied in a day? Yes, very good question. I will answer it. So we have two main. Uh, uh, compounds that we use for nail lacquer. One is the amrolfin and one is cyclopyroxamine. Cyclopyroxamine has to be used on a daily basis. So you have to ask the patient to apply it daily on the affected nail, okay? And uh, they don't need to remove the earlier coat. So for five to six days in a week, they have to keep applying uh, on the affected nail. The seventh day, they can remove it with a uh, nail paint remover. Uh, file it, cut it, whatever needs to be done has to be done once a week. And the rest of the six days, they, the patient has to uh, keep on applying it on the nail without removing it every day. Uh, when it comes to endorphin, usually once a week is enough. And uh, I usually recommend it, uh, see oral antifungals, we only give for two to three months in cases of uh, nail infections. So for the next six to nine months to up to 12 years, because uh, if we are talking about a toe nail infection, uh, it takes around 9 to 12 months for the entire nail to get clear and the new nail to come, which is free from the fungal infection. So you can continue it to after, uh, even after stopping the, uh, the oral therapy, you can continue it for 6 to 9 months. It, it usually takes that much time. So that is the duration that you can continue. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, there's also a query regarding uh, how uh, useful is a corn cap. We have these over-the-counter preparations called corn cap, which people tend to buy and apply on the uh, corn directly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very commonly used and it, uh, the patient then comes to us with a lot of pain. So I advise not using corn caps because what it does is it's basically, basically constricting ring. Okay, and that they apply uh, and they say that this will, you know, just take it out. It doesn't do that because it's, uh, and it is a cylindrical, uh, uh, it's a conical, uh, uh, the corn is basically conical, with the tip inside. Okay, so the top is on the surface and the tip is inside. So what this corn cap does is it just increases 
the pressure and the pain okay so i don't recommend we don't recommend uh, using corn caps at all because one you never know whether, whether it is a wart or a corn like i told they can be quite similar looking uh, when it happens on the feet so better to use a salicylic acid or lactic acid combination uh, cream instead of a corn cap because corn cap leads to a lot of symptoms even in patient who didn't have any symptoms earlier come to us with pain and maceration so we don't usually recommend corn caps okay uh, thank you ma'am and uh, a last query uh, we also have these uh, anti fungal powders uh, that are very popular especially among our cjhs beneficiaries who tend to use it prophylactically at times so uh, is there any particular guideline regarding its usage or where powders and where creams can be given something of that sort yeah. so i'll tell you this is another again a very good question what we need to do is uh, what we need to know is that in cases where there is intrathigo or maceration like i showed for candidiasis in those cases only when you know the skin folds are used and there is a lot of wet mo uh, moist area for 2 to 3 weeks you can give a powder just to dry that lesion but it should not be used prophylactically because it even this can lead to a lot of uh, antifungal resistance because the concentration of clotrimazole in those powders is not very high so it is not to be used prophylactically avoid Uh, giving it unless and until the patient actually has a macerated uh, lesion, wet lesion, especially in the flexures or interweb spaces. In those cases, you can still give uh, antifungal powder, and only for a limited time, maybe say two to three weeks or three to four weeks, not more than that. Uh, but I know it it is very difficult to wean them off to tell them to not apply it. But uh, we do need to tell them that it is not to be used for a long. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's about it regarding the queries in the chat box. So, uh, on behalf of everyone, I thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the participants for being such attentive learners. Thank you, everyone. Wishing everybody a happy Holi, and uh, hoping yes, to see you next month. Thank you, ma'am. Hoping to see everyone next month for a new CME. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitya. Thank you.